ekstremizma na anarhizmu. To je nekoja druga tema, ne je tema na ovo predavanje, no sakam da da je uvedan v načinot in pristapot na to, kako džavto ki imprinirga na robotite. V ovoj slučaj, predavanje tukaj je videl za vrskite na umetnosti, so ti režimi na diskurzivnosti in postavovanje to na listinate in lagata vnatr sistemot na kapitalizmu. Tako što, eve, drago mi je, što ste ovde, profesor Džavto. I hvala puno, hvala za uvod. I hvala svima što ste tu. Ja ću pričati na engleskom. Ne znam tačno zašto, verovatno. I'll switch to English so that Carlos can also understand. And... And the presentation uh, was prepared in English, so I think that's just an uh, easier way to do it, but I suppose we can also later on discuss both in uh, Macedonian or Serbian or English, whatever is easier. Uh, thank you for, co for coming and taking time uh, today to discuss these topics. So the, uh, this title uh, is, of course, a little bit... Uh, uh, maybe extravagant trying to capture some of the issues that I would like to focus on today and but it captures the, the essence of what uh, I'm interested in when it comes to the issue of art and aesthetics and art theory over the course of modernity and also it relates uh, to all sorts of political and ideological issues that I think uh, need to be considered together if uh, we want to get a better grasp of uh, the place and meaning of aesthetics and also all sorts of other phenomena, but in this case, in particular, art within contemporary uh, society. So I'll start with, uh, with this uh, simple and, and naive question. You know, what do we mean when we say art? Uh, and a good way, I think, to start thinking about this is a very nice movie from 2009. It's now a little bit old, but I think still is very relevant for uh, the way in which contemporary system of art works. So if you haven't seen it, I strongly suggest you to... to it's first of all a good movie, but it also poses all sorts of questions that we are going to discuss uh, today. So I'll just briefly tell you about... Uh, how many of you have seen it, actually? No? Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a background. So this, the story is about, basically, contemporary art world, how it works, and it revolves around two brothers, both of them in, the, in different fields of art. So Josh is a successful commercial painter, who believes in all these uh, typically modernist ideas about art. He believes in inspiration, he believes in talent, he believes in beauty as being fundamental for the whole enterprise of art. He sells well. Uh, he is not one of the leading painters, artists. He doesn't sell that well, but he sells well enough to sustain the gallery of his uh, art manager or uh, gallerist. And he has this brother, Adrian, who is an avant-garde artist, who doesn't make any money. He cannot actually get more than two people, including family members, to come to his performances. Uh, but he has all sorts of ideas about what art is as a creative enterprise, going against social codes, against... Uh, some of the fundamental modernist ideas of what art is. But in a certain sense, it's nicely positioned because both of them, in a certain sense, remain within the modernist paradigm. So uh, this is Josh uh, painting abstract paintings that, as I said, sell very well. And of course, there is always, there must be a femme fatale. In this case, Madeleine is uh, the, his girlfriend and the gallery owner, so she sells his art, but she doesn't want to show his art in her gallery. So he cannot get a show in her gallery, but uh, she sustains her gallery uh, 
partly based on selling his, his works. Uh, but she is interested in, when it comes to what she shows in her gallery, in this kind of stuff. Uh, that's an artwork, <clears throat> meaning nothing. It's titled uh, Untitled, so the movie is untitled. And she promotes all sorts of avant-garde activities, uh, you know, people like artists who have some deep visions, great visions about what our creativity and inspiration is, but it's not commercial, like you don't necessarily sell that. And she falls in love later on with Adrian, and when this is kind of revealed to Josh, he and he protests constantly against what art has become, what she shows, it has no aesthetics, no aesthetic value, no kind of beauty. He utters these words, when did beauty become so fucking ugly? Uh, and that is one of a comment on how many feel about the current state of affairs in the sphere of art. Many would object to a lot of contemporary and modern art based on the idea, uh, what the heck is this? It has nothing to do with aesthetics. It has nothing to do with traditional aesthetic criteria. You cannot even call it beautiful in any meaningful sense. And yet we still consider it art. So Josh approaches it from this perspective. Traditional aesthetics by traditional, I don't, only, I don't mean representative art but traditional concept of art in the sense that aesthetic categories are considered vital for the whole enterprise of art. Uh, Josh, as I, uh, Adrian, as I said, is into all sorts of avant-garde things, and during uh, two dinners during the film, he actually has these uh, kind of comments. You know, when people ask when his brother pushes him, why don't you try to rethink what you're doing so that you can get more people that uh, your art can sell, he asks, is the marketplace the measure of our culture? So that's the first explicit link with our topic, which is capitalism and the whole modern economic system and art. And then the second one, when during another dinner, when they uh, kind of posh society of the East Coast, get together and discuss to discuss art and harmony and how do we uh, create all these criteria. He says also this, harmony was a capitalist plot to sell pianos. Uh, again, linking the whole concept of aesthetics with actually the emergence of uh, modern society. And you have, when you see the movie, you have a lot of, almost every second sentence is uh, taken from some of the uh, most influential modern paradigms about what are these aesthetics uh, going back to the 18th century up to up to now. So what do we mean when we say art? Well, it, we learned over the course of the 20th century that anything, formally speaking, can be a ver uh, work of art. So it can be whatever you can think of. But the fact remains that not everything is art. And the question there becomes that you can use as, as uh, also uh, uh, to practice to think about, uh, to explore these concepts. What, what, what does it mean? So formally speaking, you don't need to follow any kind of aesthetic criteria up to the point that it doesn't, something doesn't need even to exist physically to be considered a work of art. So on the one hand, we have unprecedented plurality when it comes to what can be included into the world of art, but not everything becomes art. So this is something that, that uh, has been uh, conceptualized during the 20th century. So first, we can think of art uh, along the lines of Josh, Josh's concepts of what art is, and that goes back to the 18th century aesthetics. Uh, art understood as an activity that has primarily to do with aesthetics, and then it can include all sorts of these things and more. But we can also think of art as a system of art, or in the famous phrase of Arthur Dento, art world. 
So Arthur Dent coined this phrase a long time ago, uh, and his, his thing was to say that once objects, two objects, one artwork and another non-artwork become visually indistinguishable. So let's think of this cup as just a stupid cup. And then the same physically, aesthetically, the same cup as a work of art. Dento's point was this breaks. So this doesn't work any longer. You cannot actually use these categories to ju judge what art is, what art is not. But that doesn't mean art disappears. That just means that we need a new thinking about what art is. And he suggested this art world as a way to say, well, in order for you to see this cup in one context as a non-artwork and in another context as an artwork, you need a theory of art. Properties, aesthetic properties alone are not sufficient. You need a theory, or as he puts it, one entire world, art world, in which that object sits. So it's not that much about physical or aesthetic properties. It's about its meaning within a context. What Dento uh, was not focused on at that time uh, was this broader set of institutions that sustain the whole art business. And one of his follower, followers uh, would later on coin the so-called institutional uh, uh, theory of art, where actually art is understood primarily as a social institution or a set of social institutions. And he proposed uh, an idea that when, when the artist creates a work of art, that's still not a work of art. That's an object. In order for that object to become a work of art, it needs to go through a whole set of social institutions until it finally becomes codified as a work of art through uh, the gallery system, uh, art fairs, art schools, art theory, museums, and stuff like that. And only actually, if you think about it, following his approach, one can understand how it's possible that one and the same thing can be art, consider art, physically speaking, materially speaking, and another, the same one, is not art. In other words, that's the way to understand why when you open nowadays any of those big, fat books on art history that go back to cave art and then up to the contemporary, when you browse it, and I use that sometimes as a teaching tool, when I give to the students, when we start some of the courses on art theory, I give them a couple of those big books and say, okay, browse through them, take half an hour, and give me just one characteristic that all these works that are reproduced there share. Just one. I mean, if you can come up with two or more, great. But one is enough. And of course, nobody can do that because there is not a single thing that you can, a single concept, a single feature that you can find looking at these works and say, okay, this is what we find both in Renaissance art and in Warhol and in Dichon and conceptual art and contemporary tenant and so on and so forth. The only thing that actually keeps this variety together is the fact that they appear within a book, book called Art History and there is a constructive theoretical framework which situates these objects within our story, Western story of art and within particular institutions. In other Another way to put it would be, of course, it's art if it sits in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Of course, it, it's art if it sits in, I don't know, Louvre and so on and so forth. And along these lines, we can also think of art as primarily uh, a market, as uh, a set of institutions that actually sell and buy and preserve and invest in art. So art as a commodity, which is something that was recognized decades ago uh, within the very artistic practice, and then later came to be conceptualized. In other words, you can think of conceptualism as a movement as precisely a way to try to create a space which would not be commercial, which would not be subjected to the laws of the market, where artworks won't be uh, primarily uh, commercial objects, but to preserve some kind of 
maybe romanticized idea of art, and we know how that story ended. So one work that illustrates these points and takes us into deeper into discussion about contemporary concept of art and its place within those social institutions is this Maurizio Catalan's uh, sculpture that was installed in the museum, uh, Guggenheim Museum, in 2016. And uh, it is one of, I would claim, the most important works of art that has been created in a long, long, long period of time. Uh, are you familiar with the object so that I don't know, should I spend more time on describing it or, yeah, no, yeah, 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 oh, okay. So it's, it's basically uh, just a toilet, a fully functional toilet installed uh, uh, in a, or rather was installed uh, in one of the restrooms in the museum on the third floor, I think, of the Guggenheim Museum. And you could use it as a visitor. So a regular toilet, except that it's made of solid gold, 18 karat gold, uh, that's the major difference. And it's named America, and it's meant to be uh, artwork, which is also functioning as a toilet. Uh, and uh, I mean, you can, I hope you don't mind my being more provocative. You can see here how, it's you, how it can be used as a full toilet. And some claim that actually only when you use it, the aesthetic dimension of it becomes fully uh, visible. So it kind of all glowing, uh, yellowish and uh, bright uh, uh, light that you get out of it. And of course, you are, since it's a toilet, you can spend some time together with this, one of the most expensive art works. So Catalans is really, he, this work uh, faces us with a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, it brings to our attention the cost. First of all, material cost. It costs more than one million dollars because it's just a huge piece of solid gold. Incredibly heavy, you know, you can also lift this up by trying, you know, and it's really heavy things. Gold is a very uh, heavy material. But also social costs of the production of art, and especially elite art. And Catalan's playing here with this concept. On the one hand, it's elite, because an elitist, it's, uh, it's gold. I mean, it costs a lot. Not everyone can make it. Not, uh, it's not that you can do it everywhere. So you need sponsors. You need money. In other words, you need to borrow it, take it from that very same capitalist world in order to create a work of art. But on the other hand, there is this popular dimension, uh, which means this expensive thing a solid piece of gold that even upper classes cannot ordinarily see unless you are a Saudi prince or something. Uh, this is, and it's a work of art, this is given to you as an ordinary visitor to actually use it and uh, uh, piece inside of it, shit inside of it, whatever you want to do as a regular toilet. So there is a kind of playing with this concept of high art, elite art, and popular art at the same time. Then... Uh, of course, a cynical uh, reflection on art, how art appears and how it's related vis-a-vis -vis, uh, who we are, including our bodies. So that also has some, brings to memory some other works from 20th century. Uh, it's also something that can be understood as a reversal of Marcel Duchamp's strategy. So Marcel Duchamp, 100 years before this, proposed this as a work of art, signing it to Richard Mott in 1970. And this was, of course, an ordinary pissoir. So Duchamp's strategy was precisely intervening in the context when this happened. Uh, the whole understanding of art was absolutely dominated by the idea that art is something that has to do with aesthetics. This way or the other, you can break aesthetic rules, you go, you make abstract art, doesn't matter, but it relied on a very modernist understanding of who the artist is and what art is. And he tried actually to question that by taking an ordinary object and putting it inside of a gallery 
and saying, well, is it just the same object if now it's defunctionalized and placed to play the role of an artwork? And this is actually, this, these kind of uh, interventions uh, gave birth to this uh, art world theory and later institutional theory of art. Catalan's work in a certain sense reverses this. So he actually uh, creates a work of art and brings it back to its proper place, uh, which is a restroom, but a restroom within a museum. So both are playing with uh, the concept of what it means for a work of art to exist, how it exists within certain social institutions that create artworks, give them this, imbue them with the spirit of art. And of course, how is that related addresses things like popular art, uh, common citizens versus expensive things and elite art. So uh, we are there now through these couple of examples. And of course, he then names it America, which also uh, becomes a kind of, or became a symbol of the capitalist system. So we are there clearly uh, seeing the relationship between capital and capitalism and art. Uh, the way contemporary art world works, and we see it in these couple of examples, the history behind that. So the question here is, of course, is this just an effect, a sporadic product, byproduct of a more general process of the neoliberal ideology being spread all over the world and becoming a kind of universal epistemology that everyone is almost obliged to follow so that this is just one manifestation of that? Or is there some deeper connection between art as a modern phenomenon, typically modern or modernist phenomenon, and the capitalist system? So the rest of the presentation will kind of be situated between these two uh, possibilities. And it, they're not really even two different ones, but rather uh, two sides maybe of the same of the same coin. So I would like now uh, to us to go through uh, the, the process of the invention of art. And of course, that title is not my own. I borrow it from Shiner, Larry Shiner, who wrote that uh, excellent book, uh, The Invention of Art, where he actually very nicely situated the development of modern aesthetics and modern ideas about art. So I'll just give you uh, one kind of shorter version of that. And of course, it's not just Shiner, it's, it's also uh, many other authors who could be uh, useful here. Uh, when we think about what we just went through, uh, we see that art, the way we think of this concept nowadays, the way it functions is a modernist invention. People will say, well, what are you talking about? Uh, there are artworks in the Middle Ages and there are artworks in the antiquity and there are, strictly speaking from this perspective, no. There are paintings, there are uh, sculptures, but, they did not perform the same role, not even similar to the one these objects started to perform in the, in the modern period. In other words, those objects, just as Duchamp was doing, we literally in the modern period, just as Duchamp took a, a urinal and made art out of it with the help of the art world or the institution, uh, institutional uh, or institutions that are behind that, we did the same with uh, ancient objects. We used some sculptures from Egypt that were something else, objects, and we moved them into the context, newly created context called art or fine art in order to appreciate them and use them for all sorts of other purposes. And what it means is and there are a couple of things here. I'm not trying here to be uh, to present a full picture, just like some of the most important elements to this complex story about the formation of modern art. First of all, it is the, the idea that modernity has to do with these concepts. 
among other things. But you can think of these concepts as being typically for the modernist enterprise. Wherever you look, you find the idea of autonomy, for example, uh, disciplinary divisions uh, as a very important one. And of course, Kant is the one, the big one, who finally codified that as a typically modern project. Uh, but you find it even before Kant, the claim, for example, that each subject should obey to its own rules and shouldn't interfere with other disciplines uh, on the basis of, let's say, that they don't just uh, address the same thing or cannot address the same thing in principle. Then you have uh, modern subjectivity and individualism, which kind of goes back also to the idea of autonomy, uh, autonomous subject. You ha we have secularism and secular society, and we also have progress, which of course corresponds to science, to technology, all sorts of things. But in a certain sense, all these ideas are also incorporated in the modern understanding of art. And that is what makes it a highly ideological concept, that in a certain sense, as we'll see, it works as a pretty much empty container, although it wasn't obvious at the beginning uh, that that would be so, which you can use to address multiple issues. So, for example, uh, the idea of progress uh, well, I would say, well, how? We, we Actually, it's a typically modern thing to appreciate various uh, different ages and, and artworks from different times. How is that we don't actually have the, the, the idea of progress? Actually, we have, at the beginning of the modern period, the whole construction of the concept of art uh, operated precisely on this presupposition, that there is a progression. There are styles that evolve and then fall, and there are different periods that are associated with better art, with worse art. In the 19th and 20th century, we changed that, but we didn't get rid of the progressist idea, because what is formalism, what is Greenberg's story, if not precisely this kind of Hegelian version applied to art, that with abstract art, high formalism, art finally fulfills its purpose, and everything before was a kind of preparation for that. It, of course, plays also a secular role. In many ways, art fills a space that was left empty with the withdrawal of the religious or the spiritual. So that many of those typically <laughs> religious ideas, meditation, spirituality, worshipping of artworks in a similar way in which we worship relics and stuff like that, modern museum as a substitute for the church or temple and so on, are also there. And of course, the ideas that subject, individual, has some kind of unique content that needs to be expressed through that. And, of course, autonomy that art is a separate sphere that it doesn't share anything fundamentally with other spheres. And that is uh, coincided with the birth of aesthetics because aesthetics was only capable to give this codification of art. So that art would become something that has its own agenda, but it's divorced from many uh, important functions within modern society, such as, for example, truth. I'll get back to that. Truth claims. We don't expect from art to tell us truth. Yes, then you make it up. All oh, art has its own truth and all of that, but we don't go, if you want to know something, you go to science in the modern period to tell you how things work and understand them, not to art. Art performs aesthetic function. And it's also something that performs from already the 17th, but especially 18th century, ideological or political role. And not only in this sense that... Uh, it can illustrate political narratives. That's what painters and sculptors have been doing for a very long time. But in the sense that this very function of the aesthetic has to do with the social and political context, that modern society started to need something like aesthetics and art to establish itself as modern society. It also, and that's this ideological part, uh, Art and aesthetic field was granted autonomy, but within the or under the patronage of modern reason. 
And when you read Baumgarten, uh, it's, it's literally there. He calls aesthetics a lower science. Like it deals with all these things that are not at the level of reason. It's not logic. But it's a younger sister of logic that deals with the sensory world. And sensory world is in a strange way separated from uh, clear ideas, clear reason. It's separated from truth. It's given autonomous place because it's feelings, emotions, and all of that. It's important, but it is codified under the sway of reason. Reason is the one who gives certain categories and puts different things uh, into their place. And that means that the realm of the aesthetic and the realm of art is not really something that deals with ontology, ontological things. You don't expect to, to be real or tell you the truth in the sense in which you expected at that time from philosophy or from science. Uh, how this autonomous aesthetic can work as political? Well, first of all, there is this interesting uh, context of the formation of the first real museum, modern museum of art, fine arts, and that's the Louvre. Yes, a little bit before that, there is the uh, in Rome a gallery, but it's a little bit different story. So the first fully autonomously established museum to take care of art as art was the Louvre. And when you think about it, how it was formed and why, the idea was to protect, to collect and protect national heritage for the sake of beauty. Why? Because in the post-revolutionary uh, France, people would just destroy images associated with the old regime, images of the emperors, church leaders, all of that, because those artworks were directly the exponents of that ideology. Instead of getting rid of them, the aesthetic argument was used in order to say, no, 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 don't destroy it. We will kind of neutralize it, ideologically wash those pieces of cloth or stone or whatever else, those objects, and we will newly conceptualize them so that they become just aesthetic objects that are worth of admiring, not because of what they represent, all those aristocrats or something, but because of their beauty. But that beauty was, and that's the ideological they are tricky, that beauty is represented to you as something neutral, that just objectively in a certain way, it's there. You should enjoy it because it's, it's beautiful. It's good art, in other words. But actually, that neutrality of the aesthetic precisely was used to establish post-revolutionary France, among other things. I'm not claiming that that was solely art. But art was used to establish new nation, to establish new social classes, to establish new society that would share something. And that's how the aesthetic becomes an important part in cultivating citizens, uh, up to the point that aestheticized behavior becomes required, so that we should obey certain ways, and museums and opera houses and all these things should play this uh, role of teaching citizens, uh, supposedly just neutrally the aesthetic uh, feeling developed in that, but that becomes linked with moral behavior, and it also brings happiness, which becomes a civil duty and which culminates then in the neoliberal, neoliberal age. And it also performs another ideological role, and that is to legitimize the new social class, or new social classes. Uh, it worked in different ways in various countries. One story was in Germany, which wasn't unified, and aesthetics actually played a role in establishing one unified nation state. Another story was in Great Britain, and with France I just tried to illustrate. But one way to think about it is that the very concept of art, what we use in English nowadays is fine art, or beaux-arts in French, or what is in Macedonian? Lepre-Wilvers. 
Lepel windows. That, that that has to do with this idea that those arts are not any longer all these other arts that perform some pragmatic function uh, that you use for healing purposes or something. That that was all art, but now this art is supposedly neutral. And it's fine or elegant or polite. These words were used also, and in the meantime, we don't use them, but they were used in English before to characterize what we now call just fine arts. And as Shani puts it uh, really nicely, those polite or elegant arts were for polite or elegant classes. So in other words, there was also a class dimension to that. Uh, citizens should be educated, but should be educated in a way which reflects the taste and concepts and uh, idealized vision of the upper classes. Uh, a couple of, and I'll try to be as brief as possible so that we have more time for, for discussion. Uh, a couple of examples how this continued to function over the course of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, again, art for nation building. During the 19th century, you have proliferation across Europe of museums, national museums, uh, and other national institutions. And we think about why is National Museum there? Well, it's again the museum, thanks for coming. Uh, the, the museum is there to actually aestheticize us, to teach us about just aesthetic behavior, but in actual practice, it constitutes a nation. It shows what the nation has and the heritage uh, that all those fictional traditions that you needed in the 19th century to establish modern, modern nations. And art and aesthetics was part of that. Uh, then you have an interesting case, and it could be, of course, not just one lecture, but one entire semester to explore it properly, the curious case of abstract art. Abstract art as the culmination of all that process of establishing art as an autonomous sphere, and according to the formalist tradition as the peak of art, kind of post-historical uh, form of art manifests itself as an empty ideological container in the sense that you can use it for whatever you need to justify social, certain social processes. Abstract art around the time of the revolution and immediately after 1917 revolution in Russia uh, functioned as a leftist project. Avant-garde art was something that was perceived as something that includes uh, social classes that were with, with no privileges, uh, something that can transform the society, something that is very much along the lines of the whole uh, leftist or Marxist uh, perspective of progress, uh, technological innovations, and democracy. It had a democratic potential, all that technology and slash art that corresponds with that. So it was, again, used just as art, as an autonomous art, but performing all these social roles. So that would be like on, let's call it, you know, on the left or far left side. Then you have moderate left. What is moderate left? Well, once Stalin came and once uh, abstract art became no, no, no in the Soviet Union, uh, you have, of course, turned to, to this... Uh, socialist realism, and it becomes very problematical to use abstract art, even with this leftist heritage <coughs> that it had. But what was then uh, done over the course of the already 40s, but especially 50s and 60s, was from the West, investment of a lot of money into promoting abstract art along the lines of its moderate left capacity to actually counterfight the ideological enemy, which is the Soviet Union and communists. But that then effectively turned also into the right, among some right-wing uh, segments of the population business world, saying, this is us, actually. This is what we fight for, and these ideas are embedded, the values of the West, uh, closely connected with big, big businesses. This is what we fight for, and of course, official name of that was freedom and, and uh, democracy and all of that, against the authoritarian, retrograde, and oppressive Soviet Union. So you can use it pretty much the way you like creating uh, appropriate theoretical frameworks. 
And then we can also see nowadays in the so-called post-ideological times, post-1989 uh, period, that art becomes also something that exploits uh, this heritage of being just a purely aesthetic phenomenon. In other words, when you go to these galleries, art fairs, all of that, uh, you will very often get various stories. Somebody uh, addresses this issue. Somebody is concerned with ecological problems. Somebody is concerned with gender issues, with equality issues, and all of that. So in a certain sense, you can say, well, it's not, not everything as such is included within one ideological framework. But the question would, could be turned upside down and say, are you outside of a certain ideological framework when you're in a supermarket only because you have three types of toothpaste to buy? So even five, even 10, even 20. But you still need the supermarket, you still need a big chain uh, of uh, multinational corporations to provide you with a context in which you are uh, presented with a certain choice. So in other words, uh, the whole thing about art functions primarily significant art, important art, art that you read about, art that a lot of money is put into, uh, functions around this uh, idea of investment. Let's treat art as just a way of investment, and many banks do that exactly, uh, exactly for, for uh, profit making purposes. So uh, the crash of 2008 was the one segment that was least affected by that was art, art market. And that's why it increased even more uh, the value of art because they were they saw it's safe to invest here. Uh, when you buy art, actually those prices don't go down even when the rest of the economy goes down. And a lot of banks started investing and then you have the whole complex market where you invest into younger artists who are cheap now, but that will, you know, their prices will skyrocket in 20 years and all of that. But more than that, you are actually buying an ideology. You are swallowing together with, with individual pieces the idea that this system, which is run by the capitalist logic and market logic, is the way to operate, is the way to think about art, is the way to evaluate it, is the way to think about it because there is enough money to promote certain tendencies. And this is also captured to go back to the movie in the movie. So this is the galleries. And this is a young businessman who's total newcomer to the world of art. He has no idea what art is. He doesn't know anything about history of art. He doesn't know anything about culture. But he has money. He is rich. And he wants to buy stuff. And he buys it constantly. Uh, and that's a way to buy social prestige. That's a way to buy your place into certain uh, elitist circles. And he wants to buy what she, what she shows. He's the only one in the movie who actually wants to buy uh, those alternative, alternative uh, uh, artistic strategies. He would just like to, you know, collect everything. He has the money. Uh, but she instructs him, she tells him this, you know, you cannot just walk into a gallery and write a check and then like you do in a supermarket. It's not about that. We need, we cultivate relationships between our buyers and our artists. And she says it's not just about writing a check, but run, one writes the history of Western civilization. In other words, by buying those artworks, you are buying into the narrative about the place of art as a typically modernist phenomenon and the whole set of social and ideological uh, mechanisms that go together with that. Uh, finally, before we start our discussion, we can also ask question, given this situation, given these dynamics and given this history, can actually art in any meaningful sense nowadays be subversive? Can it be used to actually counterfeit some of those uh, dominant ideologies or uh, political and ideological mechanisms? Some propose, like here, uh, from the famous hyper, hyper allergic uh, 
website, that actually certain types of artworks would be desirable. That actually having uh, something like Felix Gonzalez, as opposed to Marina Abramovic, uh, or Ringhold, as opposed to Jeff Koons, would be a way to shift the attention, would be a way to actually use forms of art, whatever that might be, either it's a performance or an installation or something, to actually bring to attention or point to those issues that <coughs> should be on our agenda high up instead of thinking along the lines of art objects is something that we see in a neutral context, we reflect upon, we enjoy, and we sell and buy at, at spectacular prices. Uh, that could be one approach, and there is a democratic element to that. The question is, of course, if we follow this train of thought, would it not end up in the same situation in which conceptual art ended up uh, after its glorious period of the 1960s and early 70s, when it became again absorbed within the system of art, and it's now those artworks that were meant not to be actually something that you can even sell and buy because they're immaterial. You can see them now in a museum and they are treated exactly the same as, as uh, any of the classical artworks. Or maybe, and that is another way to think about it, we should completely try to set aside the concept of art and think about creative practices more generally. So not just something that is bound to be within the institutions currently existing institutions of art and its capitalist logic, but rather something that is a, a much more open field that encourages people to activate their creative potentials and means of doing things and thinking about things across different media, across different uh, social classes, across different institutions, and maybe that could uh, change the games of the rule and be a way to kind of escape a little bit or at least deconstruct uh, art as an ideology and nowadays also as an ideology that works for the big businesses. But we can discuss it uh, now, so I would not bother you more. I don't think actually, I think that's the last one. Yeah. So, any, yeah? Um, because we said that abstract art is a kind of way to battle the, the ideologies, would it be safe to say that the anomaly of abstract art is one weapon that it uses to battle the capitalistic nature of, well, it's not nature, but the capitalist, I'll say nature because I can't find any better words, of art today, because it goes against everything that we say words. Uh, can, you, can you repeat it again? I, I, I missed the first art, part, okay. And it's an anomaly, or well, the fighting against the normal, um, acceptable uh, characteristics of art, is that a weapon to, of, of the abstract art to fight the normal... Mm. You mean nowadays or, or at the time when at abstract the time. at when the time? It, when it but that, that's precisely the problem. So one thing that, and that's a more general issue, very often you, you have uh, various things that start as an emancipation project. So abstract art, at a time when it started, you could claim, well, there was, it was conquering new areas, new realms of freedom, and in that sense it was progressive and it was something uh, that was innovative and good. The problem is that, first of all, it very easily becomes something established and something that is used by various power agents. And if you're not careful enough, and the question is if we can ever actually be careful enough, uh, you can very easily end up in supporting certain power structures by trying to subvert them uh, in the first place. And that is what happened with abstract art. So it's not that when the abstract art appeared that anybody actually uh, wanted it to be uh, the promoter of capitalism, let's say, or the promoter of a, of a certain ideological model. Uh, up to a point, the, the, the idea was precisely let's just focus on just the aesthetic dimension in order to avoid being ideological. 
But the problem was that that very aesthetic dimension was never neutral and was never ideological less. The aesthetic dimension was contextualized from the very beginning of the modern project as an ideology. So the question is then, uh, you know, what is that that we do if we try to just find spaces of freedom within one dominant paradigm? And you can, of course, say that we can never uh, totally see from an abstract perspective uh, neutrally all these various ideological cages. In a certain sense, we, we always operate within an ideological framework. But then the question is, let's be, uh, that would be my point, let's be open about it. So let's not pre pretend that we are playing a neutral game, objectively depicting something or just playing uh, within one isolated field which has no social or ideological consequences whatsoever because that's first of all uh, an abstraction, it, it cannot be done. Uh, let's be open about the agenda that we have and then try to think it through. And I have a follow-up question, mm -hmm. just real quick. Uh, just because when it started, was, its whole intention was to go against this, and nowadays it's <coughs> more or less part of the institution. Would that mean that there is no escaping the grasps of capitalism in art? Well, that's the question that I actually want to ask. That's why I, 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 I didn't want... I was thinking, should I name it... Uh, should art... Uh, survive capitalism or should it uh, outlive capitalism and I think uh, I, I uh, you know it pretty much depends how we decide in the future to use that concept it's not a fixed thing it cannot it can be changed I think it's so charged with all that ideology that up to the point that it's very difficult to think about art without contextualizing it into all that aesthetic and institutional discourse. That's why I, I propose creative practices as, as a way to just escape that and say, no, no, actually, you don't need art fair, you don't need art market, and by the way, you don't even need art schools uh, uh, to do that kind of creative practices. But it, uh, whether it can escape capitalism, uh, one way to think about it is whether anything can escape capitalism. Uh, and uh, and it's uh, uh, you know you can criticize Zizek for many things, but uh, but he's he's right in his observation that nowadays we can think of everything. Uh, you can think of the end of the world. You can think of uh, you know uh, having an alternative body, changing your mind, uploading your mind, and computer. We can think of everything: aliens, non-aliens, everything. The only thing that's unthinkable is getting rid of capitalism. Uh, so that means uh, it's it's so strongly there as a dominant ideology that we don't notice it. And as every good ideology, the best ideology is the one that you don't notice, that you just operate within, it's just like fish surrounded with water. You know, like they don't think about it, it's like, oh, what it means to get rid of water. You know, it doesn't mean anything, you know, you, you just operate there, but you can ask questions within that framework. So pretty much we behave that way. We kind of assume also in the academic discourse, it's not just art, in all sorts of... We assume late version of capitalism as a new ontology and a new epistemology. And we, even many of those on the left, actually buy into the same narrative. If, if the question becomes like, are we just going to raise a little bit of taxes? Are we going to, you know, do this program or that program? You're still actually kind of legitimizing the dominant order and then trying to find various solutions to fix individual problems without questioning the framework as such. So it pretty much the, the answer to that question uh, depends on the answer whether we can think of, of non-capitalist paradigms. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think, yeah. I was curious when you said that art is closely tied to the ruling force or the state because they set up the standards for what is judged art but also the value for it. For example, if a powerful emperor likes something particularly, he'll kind of elevate that as fine art. Fine art. Even modern capitalism, what we consider whatever, abstract art as an example, as the dominant force and tool, he consider that fine art. But what will become of art in the sense of in a post-state system, like an anarchistic state? Whatever. It's a box of more than state in anarchy, but still, I'm going to say it. Where you won't really be able to have a capability to deem what is good. What becomes of art then when you don't even have the standards? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that. Uh, the, the, the thing there, what, what's the major, uh, my problem with major 
anarchist thinkers, and I consider myself anarchist, uh, is that m for most of the time, the focus of the attention, and that was under completely understandable given the context of the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, was on the state and how we get rid of the state. And then most of the anarchists, even nowadays, you know, it's about state and criticizing the state and, and all that and trying to dismantle the state. I think that's not the right anarchist approach for a simple reason that you, once you become fixed on something, you become dramatic about something, uh, you can miss all sorts of other, even more powerful power agents uh, than the states. And we live in a situation now in the world where actually private businesses, corporations are more powerful than most of the states. So if you want to dismantle state, fine, good, good luck with that. First of all, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. But then you can actually end up in a complete slavery that would be uh, very similar to ancient slavery with no rights, which up to a point happens also within the state framework. So in a paradoxical way, actually, if you are consequential anarchist, I think state in certain situations can even be used to fight even more oppressive structures because sometimes you can get rid of the state, but then you'll be you know, uh, social sphere would be dominated by gang groups and, you know, organized crime. So is that the kind of society you want to live in? So it's, it's complicated. So that's why I would always, my approach would be, let's target power structures, uh, no matter what form uh, they take. And one part of the story of targeting power structure is the story of art and aesthetic. So whether, uh, again, depends on how we think about it. If we think about art primarily in terms of creative practices, I think it is up to point necessary for an anarchist society. Because uh, by activating creative potentials, you get to think about different modes of organizing things, getting out of dominant paradigms, uh, and all that. That cannot be done without creating this space of freedom. And, and then having all sorts of creative practices, whether you will need an institution that would kind of keep it exhibited for certain ideals, I don't know. And I don't think there are uh, universal answers to that. But I think uh, uh, my approach would be uh, if it serves certain strategy, it can be used, but let's not be dogmatic about it. Uh, and especially not in different contexts, because what might work in one context very often is not applicable to another context. So, yeah. I have another question concerning the character, not the art itself. Because in Norman, they have so much access to art in general because of the internet, there's become a new character of people I found online, especially this developed, which have a will to involve their lives in art. Enough, enough of a will to understand art and to do it. And you usually find these characters mask their complexions and perversions with art. An example I'll take from an exhibition I don't know if you can call it a couple of years back. A feminist artist in Sweden, I believe it was, basically went to the public square, got naked, and shoved eggs with color instead of vagina, and dropped down on a, on a canvas. And that was called art. But the problem is that she was trying to critique oppression. But you're already living in Sweden, one of the most freest and liberal countries. In the end, you just end up a pervert because you didn't change anything. And that's my problem with the modern artsy character I call it. They don't understand art, they just want to do it. And in the end, they end up malicious and pernicious to art instead of actually advancing and helping it. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you're right. There in the diagnosis, I, I can tell you another story that um, I was at a conference in New York, and some friends from from uh, Great Britain and some Americans uh, were also there. And then they we met in front of the hotel, and they told me, "Are you coming with us to the protests? What protests?" And, and it turned out that there was a Russian conductor uh, that was supposed to uh, perform a concert in, uh, I don't know, Carnegie Hall or something. Uh, and, and, they were, and there were protests against this uh, Russian conductor because at some point of time he said something in favor of Putin or praise Putin or something like that. And I, I just couldn't even understand. You know, and I told this friend, you know, uh, 
I applaud to people who uh, protest against uh, the regime of this country in Washington or New York. It's all too easy, and I don't think what's the point of protesting against Russian conductor and Putin in New York. It's just like, yeah, let's organize protests against a local governor in, uh, I don't know, South Korea somewhere. In, in, you know, it just doesn't, first of all, you're not changing anything. You, know? you are just taking these high moral grounds, pretending to be an activist who contributes to, to real change, but you're not contributing to real change. And plus, you don't uh, invest that energy into addressing oppressiveness and real issues where you are. So, like, to this uh, friend of mine, we, we are friends, but we are really don't understand that uh, he's, he's an intellectual, very actually established. They are saying, so don't you have anything to protest against in, in, in the UK? You go to New York, protest against Putin, fine. I applaud people who protest against Putin in Moscow or St. Petersburg. That's something to be uh, supported and not, uh, you know, protesting fix something that you can fix. So the same would go for this. Um, yeah, in a certain sense, Sweden is a uh, reasonably free and organized country, but with a lot of problems. And, and, and many problems will become, I think, even more and more visible. Uh, there is no society and state without problems, and some of them going very deep. Uh, so uh, I would say this, uh, yes, it's easy to promote, to fight for uh, gender equality and uh, gay rights in Sweden. Yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's almost not really, but it's almost like, uh, I don't know, fighting for the access of seawater in, in uh, Cyprus. Uh, it's it's you know it's not the, it's not high up on the agenda. If you really want to address some social issues, that would not be among the top. I don't know how many. On the other hand, if you are in places like Russia, yeah, there is a real oppression, and and actually making something that addresses that and you are using art forms to address these issues and question them makes a lot of sense. There was one question here before, but it no, seems, yeah, that was. But I think he, you you were first, and then we are going there. Uh, I have a few questions now that you mentioned Slava Zizek. Um, I remember one thing about the destruction of the statues in Palmyra by Isil. So he is making this connection relation uh, with the statues and the art by the Isil and by the Western cowardly approach. He says that actually they had like a real uh, living uh, relation with those statues. Real honest approach against the Western uh, approach that is kind of with the museums and stuff. It's kind of uh, cowardly and pro uh, protective stance, taking protective stance. So he says that uh, these people by by ISIL, these destroyers, terrorists, had uh, honest and real uh, relation with those statues, like art, something that can threaten their belief and it's real, and in a way uh, will destroy this beauty because this beauty is destroying us. Uh, that was my first commentary, and second, I want to ask you an opinion about the imprisonment of uh, icons in the museums uh, by the church, because we have uh, we are dealing now with uh, thievery and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, both interesting questions. Uh, the first one about uh, you know ISIS and destruction of of, of those temples. Uh, it's actually. Uh, I don't see anything very specifically, let's say, Islamist about that. Because uh, let's not forget that uh, Western powers destroyed uh, most of the sites uh, in their military campaigns in Iraq and, uh, and, uh, and Syria and others. So some of them completely destroyed beyond reparation. So in a certain sense, uh, 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 you know, it would be interesting to implement the same logic to see that kind of destruction w would then uh, the artwork function in the same in the same way, uh, probably not because it's always like there are side effects of that. But there is enormous destruction of, of cultural heritage. Uh, I don't think that, and that would be my point uh, to disassociate the ever changing ideological framework which tell us what certain objects are and how to uh, deal with them from the objects themselves. Because sometimes it's not necessary to destroy something. It's enough to change the ideological framework. And that would be, uh, you know, my, uh, if somebody from, 
you know, ask me, okay, these statues stand for something we are against. You know, we, we react, we see this as, as uh, symbols of some kind of uh, whatever, oppression or something that goes against uh, my identity. I would say, well, you know, construct a framework in which uh, they appear something else. Uh, because I don't necessarily see that it needs to be destro uh, destroyed in order to uh, be incorporated into something that would be a serious social and political program. But of course, that wasn't a serious social and political program. That was, uh, you know, a destructive uh, terrorist organization. We know how it evolved, and and at that point, it doesn't become really a matter of aesthetics. It re it really becomes a matter of military strategies and, and how to, to defeat something that obviously is an evil. But uh, uh, pretty much you can do what the French and others did with those uh, uh, objects that uh, were standing for other kind of power and that people didn't like, but you created a framework in which that becomes uh, something uh, useful, meaningful. Uh, the second uh, part was part of the question. Yeah, um would you have precious icons, for example? Yes, the icons. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, there is a lot written on that, how icons cease to perform their function when they are situated within a museum. Uh, it's true. Uh, the problem there is that if, and that's why, you know, none of these things, there are no easy solutions. Uh, the problem is that most of those icons that we have nowadays and we appreciate so much and we love them and we use them actually to sustain all sorts of stories from orthodox identity to aesthetics to alternative aesthetics to theology, all of that, uh, they were preserved precisely because somebody invented the Council of uh, Or the same with the Greek uh, sculptures and, and reliefs there. So uh, that is important to keep in mind. So there are no there are easy solutions. Uh, the general, and that's a typically modern thing. So nowadays, when we are we care so much about preservation of certain iconostases or or certain icons or certain architecture, uh, even within strictly speaking ecclesiastical context, we actually act as moderns. Because in Middle Ages, uh, they would uh, okay, an icon gets dirty, you repaint it or you you know burn it or put something new, no problem. You know, it, it performs the same function. It's the same, conceptual speaking, it's the same icon. You can, it's an idol, it's starting to become an idol. It, it becomes, it, yes, it, 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 it substitutes it, uh, this kind of the other way of relating to objects, and then there is the aura created around it. So again, what is the right approach to that? Well, uh, nowadays you don't necessarily make that choice because you can actually create churches and church environments that would be protective enough and you would have them and all of that. So uh, we it's ever-changing context, but I think it would be too simplistic then to say just let's take all the icons and return them uh, into the church environment, especially with the knowledge of how all Orthodox churches function, uh, I would be first to react against against that. Uh, there was a question over there, not any longer. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you yeah, I think so. There was... Okay. So uh, I I almost completely agree with everything that you said. So that's dangerous. No, it's sad. Actually. <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> you presented us with the sort of a Zeno's paradox. You know, you create uh, something which is called art supposed to be autonomous and in the end it turns out that it's not, it's commodified uh, and I can think of a number of and I was thinking about a, a, a number of examples which may contradict that but at the end as I contemplated about them I found out that actually all of them can be commodified in a certain sense and I was trying to uh, oppose this uh, notion that Bernard Chumi, the famous architect and uh, uh, theorist of contemporary architecture, once said that uh, he views architecture more as an event than as a creation of another object. So you uh, create an environment 
where uh, events happen. But also, when you think about it, all those events that would happen can be uh, archived, can be filmed, and can be commodified at the end. So my uh, uh, only escape from this uh, aporia What's the, what's the word uh, for the uh, one no, way street, yeah, yeah, yeah. dead end, dead end. One, uh, uh, my only is, uh, possible escape from this dead end uh, the commodification of art into neoliberal capitalism is to uh, uh, try to find out find art in uh, repressive regimes and I suppose you are uh, familiar with the band Pussy Riot and the performances that they did and they did those performances and they paid dear price about them, for them uh, and I think that those performances uh, are the closest thing, uh, thing that uh, comes to art in our day and age also, I, I saw uh, a documentary about uh, a thing called Takwa War. It's for, it's for punk hardcore, but uh, in an in a Islamic way. Uh, in uh, places like Iran or, uh, I don't know, Iran probably. It's completely uh, uh, forbidden for rock, rock and roll groups to exist, uh, let alone punk, punk, punk bands. So uh, there, uh, Pussy Riot and these types of bands are, 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 are acting at the uh, margins of society that uh, uh, represses them, which makes their works <coughs> maybe, in our day and age, closest things to art that we can imagine. Yeah, it's, I more yeah. uh, like a commentary than yeah. a question. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it, it, those presses, whether it's, uh, you know, because m my only hesitation there would be to call it the only meaningful way to do art. Uh, you know, it's, I think, uh, it's a very meaningful way to uh, use art forms to, as, a, as a means of social and political change. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so that would be uh, this so whatever it is a performance that it's not primarily there to fit in some kind of existing system or affirm certain uh, aesthetics because at the end of the day uh, what is the fundamental problem here or one of the fundamental problems is the way those power structures function and then narratives that codify that power come as you know secondary element so what pussy right what they did, I, I think, was very meaningful. It, it also turned them into a global phenomenon, and prior to that, uh, they were a marginal punk group that nobody outside of uh, obscure circles in Moscow knew about. Uh, but it became a global phenomenon, and then the question becomes, once you do that, once you attract this position, what is that that you do with it? You know, do you turn into a commercial thing? Do you do it into a you know superstar that starts fulfilling other ideological roles, or do you try to escape that trap that will immediately uh, entrap you by just the very nature of how things uh, work? If I can interject, I Google them just right now to make sure because I uh, I, I, I they make it human. Uh, they they haven't released actually anything. Yeah, and we know why. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, by any means, it seems to me they're trying to escape the uh, capitalist uh, uh, clause. Well, some of them certainly. Some of them certainly. I'm not sure about the others. Uh, yeah. Just if, do we have who, who's in charge here of uh, time you. and <laughs> I'm in charge? Okay. Oh, you are. If, uh, if uh, we have. Uh, I don't know, atmosphere for uh, continuing uh, questions and... Uh, but do we have some, do we need to finish by two or something? Well, we have freedom. Okay, uh, we can. Okay, so there is... Uh,
Yeah, okay, but we still got some time, so okay. But, uh, this question about uh, uh, so this uh, this discussion of, of what wonder leads me to one conception, one conception that uh, if we take art and reduce, if we reduce art only on its aesthetical dimension, we are making some kind of system of codification within the capitalism. If we uh, uh, conceptualize art as something that it, uh, it has different dimensions besides this aesthetical, for instance, ritual, political, uh, uh, connected with philosophy of life, with regimes, then we are uh, making a, a path for subversive uh, praxis. If, if we, that, that, uh, that leads me to conclusion that uh, we must demodernize art if we want to uh, make a path for uh, subversive uh, practice within the, the capitalism. I'm not sure about that because for, I, I can't think of what would that mean in in, in actual practice. I my, my approach would be, and of course it's uh, it's it's a complicated thing. You know, it's very difficult to you know, think of some solutions. But my approach would be, uh, you know, let's try to use all the tools that are available to us. So uh, <coughs> like there is no easy escape from modernity. Like you can complain about millions of things uh, related to modernity. Uh, Western rationalism, uh, the dominance of reason, uh, colonialism, all of these things are part, part of the game. But like there is no, uh, solution is not let's escape to some kind of non-modernity. My solution would be let's use uh, the emancipatory potentials that are present within the modern projects and then try to make something with it. So if certain aesthetics can be used so to act subversively within the system fine uh, if uh, because it's, it's just like the question like what do you do if you if you live in a society that's dominated by big corporations okay and in order to make your living you need to work for one of those corporations uh, is it an ethical you know some would say uh, ethical puritans you know oh no if you work for them you buy into debt, you're supporting the dominant system, it's hopeless, the only way is to be outside. Maybe in some context, but in some contexts, if you're outside, you'll just starve and you won't change anything mm -hmm. and you'll die. So uh, uh, for me, if there is no e as easy escape, would be to work, you, you need to work there. Work, but work subversively within the system. Use the mechanisms that are available to actually try to dismantle those oppressive structures uh, and then arrive at some point at the stage where there is more freedom. So I would say the same with all these complicated institutions. And, and our, for example, art school can be used either to propagate the narratives, meaningless narratives about what is uh, static rather than what is art, or it can be used to actually critically examine that and try to think of other practices how to intervene. So the choice is among you know the people what you do a simple escape i don't believe that that's that that's that's possible uh first of all we use certain categories to think about we happen to be in a certain social uh historical context that's determined by many different forces and uh, by learning and acting and all of that we can try to work something make something out of that uh, but a simple retreat or a simple escape that's where I'm very suspicious of because uh, that I means very solid ground. Escape because yeah. the uh, demodernization, I think that it's uh, it's uh, it, uh, it's possible only if you uh, grasp the modernity because it's not in something like escape to the uh, past times or something like that, but it's a. Uh, uh, for instance, Pussy Rhymes, uh, the songs, they are aesthetically irrelevant for me. The, the, the significance of Pussy Riot is not artistic, it's politically uh, relevant. Uh, they uh, they uh, escape from the capitalism just because they uh, completely ignore the aesthetical value of their art. 
the, the, the value in commercial world is their is political relevance. It's not aesthetical yes. relevance. They but do not. They didn't uh, uh, make any. I don't know. Make, for me, it's not, it's not creative uh, music. It's completely, absolutely, copy of uh, mannerism and something like that. It's, there is nothing aesthetically relevant in, in their uh, music, but its uh, uh, its significance is in political and uh, uh, non aesthetical values that was uh, 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 a part inherent to art from the past times. For instance, the ritual. I mean, for instance, in folk music, in folk music, it's, uh, it's on one level, it's free from capitalism because they, they gathering, people are gathering in villages and they play music because they are free. But in the same time, that music has some kind of uh, uh, part of the, of, of the life without the system of capitalism. But what do you mean by, by demodernization? Like, what is that to be... Uh... To, to include... Uh, the dimensions in art that are not aesthetical. <coughs> but uh, in a certain sense, that's, that was the point here. Uh, from the very beginning, it has never, in a certain sense, been just aesthetical. That's, that's the point. Mm -hmm. So, like, the very aesthetic, aesthetical was political uh, yes, and is political. And in the meantime, everything that's also non aesthetical in a traditional sense is also included into the system. But so, now, uh, uh, you said that. Uh, uh, in, in, when the modern art was invented, it was in, invented as a, some kind of ideology that art has only aesthetical dimension, just to be able to put all kind of ideology to art. Yeah, I because yeah, you, uh, like uh, for instance, the art that represent ritual, political connections with the kings, uh, uh, that art. Uh, ha uh, has something uh, connected with the uh, not aesthetical dimensions. For that's why uh, you said that this French mm -hmm. revolution they uh, re uh, uh, make uh, uh, everything redundant and they kept only aesthetical. No, 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 aesthetical no, no, no. is uh, uh, a path to uh, create ideology based only on aesthetical. No, no, the aesthetic argument was used to make possible the inclusion of all sorts of things yes, into the, into the project. Because if you kept the, the old dimension of art, you cannot be able to put that There was nothing to yeah. be kept because there was no art. So uh, there were rituals, but they became art only with this modern uh, invention of the categories that turn them into into art. So what what uh, but but let, let's take another uh, example. It it seems to me that like it's a, it's a sample for example how do can we demodernize modern reason? What would that project look like? Uh, and 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 you have alternative some kind of demodernization. Uh, there is, but the question is there. You know, uh, are you uh, is is it demodernization? Sounds to me as a way to kind of let's deconstruct that. Let's uh, uh, tear something down or apart. Uh, but but we, I, I, it would mean that we can assume some kind of out of more modernity position in order to do that. And I just don't see what would that uh, mean. Because in addition to be everything that's associated with uh, uh, authoritarianism of the modern age and the uh, rule of reason and uh, impression, all of that, modernity also means emancipation and liberation. Mm -hmm. So instead of the modern modernizing things, I would say let's remodernize or, or modernize anew. Let's uh, think outside of those dominant paradigms by being aware that there were many uh, constructive strategies there that, that got us uh, all sorts of wonderful things like, uh, you know, we have uh, medications, we don't need to die. Now we have lifespan that is almost doubled compared to what was there 500 years ago. We got all sorts of, that's modernity. Modernity is also our chance that we can gather together here and talk about these issues without having 
a local uh, bishop or imam or, or, or a local aristocrat to get us all killed if we say something that, that, that they don't like. Uh, that's also modernity, in addition to imperialism, in addition to everything else. So uh, th that's my question. Is instead of uh, trying to annul or get out of the whole project, I think would be let's just be more critical and more careful than the moderns were when they were proposing certain things. Because I don't believe that Voltaire or anybody of those guys actually wanted to establish a system, you know, a system which would be oppressive. No, they were trying to think along the lines of what would be emancipatory. And claiming reason, as opposed to blind faith, meant emancipation at that time. Meant don't follow what stupid bishop or pope tells you. Think for yourself, try to find argument, all of that. You know, what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that is if you establish that as an absolute criterion that has only metaphysical and epistemic relevance, and you rule out everything else as something not being in principle associated with truth, and then you absolutize uh, cognitive capacities, and then you end up in a completely messed up epistemology, which is positivism of the 19th century. Uh, but we are in a, in a position when we can say, no, 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 these things happen, and this was the context. Let's try to think about this context before we propose now new measures that can be um, can be manifested yeah, as oppressive. The problem is uh, you cannot escape from the episteme, as Foucault puts it. Nobody yeah. is able to, to escape the, the historical context and episteme that rules the, all the regimes and, uh, and discourses. Mm. So probably it's... Uh, yeah, but we can be more honest about it, uh, yes. the episteme. Okay. Yeah, that's my, that would be my... Okay, I think we have time for two short comments. I just want yeah. to, I just want to go back to what the professor mm -hmm. said earlier with the dead end. Uh, I'm going to use two examples. The first example is from a man called Andrew, Andrew Jackson Jihad, which are in the folk punk band from America. Mm -hmm. And they said uh, only the stupid people uh, rush with their heads into the wall when they go to a dead end. And when they said that, they meant as in when they, when they made when they started making music, actually, they were going against everything Bush stood for, and they were highly criticized for that. But they, by saying that they don't like to go like with their heads to the wall, means that you need to go backwards from the dead end to find a different way to to get to your goal. And then there's another American sketch comedy group called Whitest Kids You Know. And they actually made a sketch where in the United States it's illegal to show how to kill the president on TV or even say that word. They made a whole sketch about that. And by making that sketch, they were really popu popular at that time, but they got cancelled two, two months later. So just by bringing up the dead end, it's more like the dead end is capitalism. And if you go against it, that's the end of it. I mean, that's the end of you. Whereas if you go back, as the band said, you might find different ways, ways to fight it. So wouldn't it be better to actually escape or retreat rather than try to, to change it from inside when in the end it's not going to end well because that's what history told us and that's what history shows. I'm not sure what history history doesn't show anything. Uh, history shows what you want it to show. Uh, uh, so it, it's just a question like a famous discussion between, uh, let's say, social Darwinists and 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 some whatever you want to call them humanists. Uh, you you have claims, and that's again from, of course, along the lines of neoliberal logic. It's just nature. History is just human nature that we fight each other and we really won't dominate each other and that oppression is there. It's a natural state. So instead of trying to subvert it or do something about it, why, why not just, uh, you know, uh, accept that as, you know, the system? Because that's what history tells us. That's what history tells you if you want to see that as a lesson from history. If you want to see, learn from history about uh, human compassion and working together and, and fighting for each other and, and preservation of others, that history will tell you that. So I, I'm not sure history is not a deterministic process, or I, I at least refuse to, to see it that I way. Mean, let, me, let me rephrase it right. more clear if it's okay. When I said history tells us, I mean uh, as in every single form of art that was uh, created to battle the, um, 
the oppression, if we can say that, of capitalism in art, was consumed by the thing they were trying to fight. That's what I meant by yeah. But but also in the process, so like we shouldn't be uh, okay. Maybe I was for the sake of clarity and and time, uh, you know, blamed art forms uh, too much, but. Uh, up to a point, they were also changing those contexts. So, in a certain sense, you act within a certain frame uh, uh, that you that you have, and certain constraints. And then, once the context changes, then of course you need to change uh, the means and strategies. Some of these artistic, we cannot say this is one story to say from art, but but uh, but let's say just think about uh, how much of uh, art in the 19th century or 20th century was used to criticize the dominant regimes. How much of, uh, uh, let's brand, brand it, uh, vaguely speaking, activist art, you know, comics and paintings and music and all of that that was reacting against National Socialism, that was reacting against capitalism, that was reacting against uh, Bolshevism, that was reacting against these things. So, uh, yes, at a later stage, it was absorbed by the system. But, sure, and then when it happens, you need to find new ways to deal with that and not get stuck uh, with certain dogmas. But at one point, it was emancipatory. So we cannot say that Russian avant-garde art wasn't emancipatory just because it was used as a role model to act against the whole leftist project. Uh, it was used, but it also did something. Wouldn't that mean, by the examples I gave mm -hmm. earlier, wouldn't that be, mean that there, is, there should be a revolution or an evolution in art? Because if we follow and if we try to not escape, then we're just evolving. Whether if we try to escape and try to find a new new way, that's more of a revolution than an evolution. As it, it, it seems to me as a pretty much purely theoretical question, because I don't I can't think of concrete situations where that that would actually matter. Uh, my my position is uh, you know let's try uh, to the best of our abilities to understand the context and forces that within which we act. And then let's try to change it, being honest about the agenda there. And my perspective is the perspective of an anarchist who, who actually doesn't like oppressive power structures. And then uh, you know we see what what are those most urgent things to address, and what are the means available to do it. And that's a constantly changing process. That that's the problem because as soon as you construct a certain conceptual framework to address certain issues and to propose certain solutions. It will need to change in order to accommodate for the new new reality that will emerge. And that's the problem with ideologies, not because we can escape or we should escape ideologies, which I don't know what would that even mean, you know, to escape an ideological thinking. It is not to be stuck within uh, a certain formulation uh, within an ideological framework. So in other words, yeah, leftist revolutionary in February uh, 1970. But... Uh, leftist and revolutionary against the oppressiveness of what is called left and revolutionary from October on of 1970. And that's that's a thing that, that is very difficult to do because uh, it requires a certain critical distance that is just not something that public discourse is receptive to and also academic departments because we much like more very well constructed conceptual cages where everything makes sense and then we reproduce that. Sure. Uh, so, sorry yeah. to close the airport, but I'm just... Okay, so see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, that would be... Uh, th th that is, I think, a big problem. So when... Uh, take, uh, take examples of liberalism. Take democracy. Why many people in, 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 in the world, and you know, the Balkans is no exception, uh, react against the council of democracy? You'll, you'll hear that, I suppose. You, you hear it everywhere. Oh, democracy, what democracy? Democracy brought us this, brought us that. We know what democracy is, you know, imperial ideas that are dressed up as democratic and all of that. Uh, does it mean we should forget about democracy? So uh, it is a certain democracy, the concept of democracy, the way it's used, the propaganda industry created around it, precisely is anti-democratic. So, uh, but you need to be flexible enough to be able to critically examine concepts to see, well, that doesn't mean that we want anti-democracy to be our social reality. It just means that we want democracy that would be capable of fighting back against 
the ideology that promotes itself as democratic, but in reality is something else. And you can do that with, with any concept. So, and these concepts are not fixed, they are not uh, metaphysical entities that just uh, exist. Uh, they, are, they, they have the content and meaning that we give them and how they operate within a certain context. So I I've just like be there very, if you want to use that word, deconstructivist in the sense of let's try to, that's my general methodology, let's try to deconstruct everything that we perceive as normality because each normality is just a special case of madness. Uh, real madness. Everything that we perceive as normal and ordinary is actually totally crazy if you just manage to uh, uh, take a different perspective. Uh, but not for the purposes like Derrida and kind of deconstruction that, that you know, uh, you deconstruct, 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 and every discourse is a deconstruction. Uh, no, let's do it for the sake of being able to see the complexities and, and the, the oppressiveness that's there, and then use conceptual and other tools to intervene. Uh, in that reality, with a full sense that this proposal that works now doesn't need to be emancipatory or operational 10 years from now. And I think that's a difficult thing because it's tied with many personal issues. You know, you get your career, you become starting with some crazy ideas, and then you change, and then social reality becomes more acceptable to that. You assume certain positions in society. You don't want to change that narrative because. Uh, that's who you are. I mean, that's what you've been doing. And all of a sudden, actually, one emancipatory discourse and the very same people who acted as prophets become part of the problem instead of part of, of, of the solution. And I think that's much more anthropological and psychological issue than uh, purely philosophical. Yeah. The question was actually a bit off topic, but concerning the protection of preservation of art, where I believe that not elevating it and giving special treatment protects the best, but its banality is what protects the best. I love a quote from use an example. Don't make something idiot proof. The universe will just send you a bigger idiot. And mm -hmm. that's the same example. A couple of years ago, in an exhibition in China, a man actually tripped on the barrier that was used to protect the painting and pushed the hole through an original Monet painting. It cost at least millions in damages by just having a barrier there to protect it. Another example is the lack of ancient works of art we have, specifically Greek sculptures. I mean, what we have remaining of those art is actually the Roman copies in marble, because Greeks prefer to use bronze as a material to make the sculptures, which eventually gets melted down into use as tools and weapons. And we just because we elevated something and made it of precious materials so focused on protecting it, we, in a sense, caused it more harm because we left it to be interacted by everything. It's quite a bit hard to convey because you can't make everything idiot-proof. It's just impossible. No, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, that's besides the point. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you cannot. And what also one thing you cannot do is to be sure that uh, your intentions will be conveyed uh, through or by the means of that you're using. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very long and complicated way from your intention and the way we do, you do, I do, anybody does. Uh, you know, how that starts functioning within the social practice and then the effects that that will have. And, and you know, all sorts of means of communication, including language, are terribly inefficient. So it's a very complicated thing. So we have complicated, you know, it's, it's not easy to clarify for ourselves what is that that we want and, and need. So, and that's the big problem with enlightenment, this presupposition that there is a kind of transparency between our uh, mind and and language and and social reality there is no transparency so there is no transparency we are not transparent to ourselves we are not transparent to other people we are in a society is not transparent and all of that so uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be responsible when it comes to predictable consequences of our actions because some things for example that you can say in academic uh, surrounding uh, because of the context because of the audience and all of that if you are responsible, you will not say on, on a TV, you know, in a TV show. 
uh, simply because the message will be formatted differently, uh, the broader audience might uh, get some other ideas. Can you completely control that process? No. And very often it turns out to be something else, and that's called uh, culture, I suppose. Uh, you know, a continuous uh, way of misinterpretations and new interpretations and, and all of that. Uh, so, yeah, we are stuck with, with that. But that doesn't mean, first of all, that we shouldn't. We should stop doing something because that would be... Uh, just uh, uh, giving up to the dominant sources of power. Uh, we should try to learn as much as we can, develop uh, develop our creative potentials, and try to be responsible as much as we can. Will you succeed every, every time? No. Uh, will you fail? Yes. But maybe on the way, with the full awareness that you may fail, you will also be able to do something good. And as somebody said that when it was, I forgot who that was, the celebration of 1968, uh, in Belgrade, the movements. So one of the participants back then said, yeah, we failed, and we know that we failed, and we failed again during the 1990s, and we know we'll fail again, but the message is, you know, you try, fail, fail better. You know, that's, that's the message. And it's not about winning, it's about failing better. It's about you will fail maybe, but maybe on the way, because it's a very complicated thing, you never know how will certain things will resonate and something unintended can actually have very good consequences and then change the social context. So is it idiot proof? No, but nothing is. Something peculiar is happening in the left, uh, the whole range of left, from the socialist communists to the anarchists, so forth. After the, the fall of the 1968, uh, the, the left has been retreated into art and social theory as a kind of drug. So we are still, today there is also another event talking about art, how art can you know, critique of capitalism and so forth. But uh, if you want to bring down something, you have to focus on its structures. And the structure of capitalism is not artistic or aesthetic. So art is completely uh, irrelevant for the fight against capitalism, if you want to fight it, organize a party, organize a trade union, revolution. And if you see the, the history of avant-garde art, those artists or social theorists were mainly organizers and activists. They were secondary artists and so forth. So it is Marx, Marx was firstly organizer and then he was a writer. So I think that the left has been retreated. Uh, capital is something that is absolutely uh, eternal. And now it's completely retreated and it's a kind of a drug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I not, not the art, but also yeah. social theory. Yeah, I agree. Uh, because, but, but the problem for me is that I don't see much left uh, in, in what's called left. Uh, because most of the time what's called left or liberal, I, I just think is mainstream um, neoliberal or capitalist. Uh, I really don't see what is in, in many of those. I mean, if you go to the East Coast, for example, in the States, and that's another important thing, that all of these discussions actually, they mean different things in different parts of the world. It's very difficult, and that, that's what you become aware when you really go and, and learn about certain contexts and you really see how much the way we think of certain ideas uh, is shaped by the place where we live and where we do things. And I, I for, for a very long time, you know, you know it abstractly, but when you see it actually that, for example, in the United States, it's a very kind of stylized ideological uh, arena in the mainstream. It means they call it left and they call it right. I just call, you know, it, it, for me, it's just like a two factions within one and the same party or one and the same worldview. Uh, but then you see why it's there and it's for, and it, it wouldn't suffice to say, to tell them, uh, many of those intellectuals on the East Coast, not everyone, of course, but like the mainstream left, people who I don't know, people who supported uh, Hillary Clinton as a great solution, you know, well, for example. Or people who, who, you know, who are completely, who worldview is shaped by, you know, reading New York Times or Boston Globe or something like that. Uh, you, it won't suffice to tell them you're stupid, you know, you don't see this. 
I think most of, many of them are stupid and they don't see it. But like, that's not the point. The point is that uh, in order to change that, in order to change the way social processes are conceptualized, you actually need to change uh, how those societies work. Because there are very real behind all of these concepts that in a theoretical discourse we can easily play with, there is a social reality, social structures behind them. Uh, and, and those structures are, you know, slow and their change is not apparent and it's, 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 a, it's a long process. So uh, I, that's why I think uh, strategies need to be appropriate to the context. Uh, that we need to be clear, like, what is that? If it's an academic discourse, I don't think it's meaningless to address these things in an academic discourse. I think, actually, it's very important. And it's important there to kind of uh, clarify these points and think critically and all of that. But, of course, the problem with many on the left and the critical theory is that they got stuck there, not really changing even that context and becoming virtually untranslatable to anything else, any other social sphere. And at that point, you become uh, that becomes a problem. So instead of actually uh, pro opening a space for critical discussion, you are kind of quietly uh, supporting uh, the dominant order of power. Uh, a different strategy needs to be implemented if you if you want to I don't know organize a strike or organize a political party. Uh, and I agree with your initial observation and that then use art as propaganda as it was used for example in the yes uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. art was yeah. propaganda for the party yeah I, I agree that that party. all of this you know rests within those structures so yes I mean just addressing the problem of art mm -hmm. well, you know it won't solve things but it doesn't mean that art cannot be or artistic practices or intervention within the art sphere that it cannot be used to change something because modern society is and that's a non, you know for better or worse is a very complicated thing uh, and it's not unified and it's not just one process it's millions of different institutions and interests with their own agendas with their, so uh, but that's a matter of strategy you know is it for me the question would be okay what is that that we want to do what is that that we can do uh, and also individuals are different, uh, so I don't believe that we should now all just do one thing. Uh, if you're a journalist, try to be critical and try to open up for space for freedom and uh, put these issues on the agenda within that framework. If you are something else, you know, you try there and you get together, but uh, the problem is deep, the problem is real. And, uh, and uh, of course, we focused here on the issue of art as ideological thing and all of that, but you know, you could focus on just the economic system and try to do something there. But very carefully, because that is also the previous uh, discussion, very often the alternatives that are presented to us or that many people claim are real alternatives are actually, I think, false alternatives. Mm -hmm. Just like, okay, let's now switch to, to uh, uh, digital uh, mm -hmm. money and all of that as a way to escape from capitalist economy. It doesn't work that easily. Okay, let's uh, conclude the discussion. Thank you. No, thank you. I think so.